Today, the end of international education. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and the list. It's worth my latest posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined again by Salvatore Babanis, who's an associate professor at the University of Sydney. Hi there. Hi, good to see you again. Well, thanks very much for coming back on the channel. You, you, you've been very busy writing papers. Uh, that's what we do for a living. You got it. <laughs> Well, it's good and uh, good to see some productive stuff coming out the back of it. And I think you've really hit an interesting subject here because your argument is that education is about to be transformed. Well, this was an article that I recently published with Times Higher Education, which is a trade journal for the higher education world, on the end of international education. Now, they framed it as the end of an era for international education, and maybe it is, but it could be literally the end. Uh, we are facing the situation that students simply aren't traveling. I mean, remember, back in February, we were all concerned in Australia about Chinese students not returning for the beginning of the school year in 2020. Well, now, you know, the way things are going, the real question is, will we have any international students come June or July when the next semester starts? Right. Um, but can it not all be done digitally? Isn't that the whole uh, new world we're in? Isn't that, or is that not well, possible? Well, we are delivering education digitally. The question is, will someone register with an overseas university to take a digital online class, especially from China, when that's particularly difficult to do across the Great Firewall of China? But let's be serious. People are not spending the money to do online education overseas. The reasons for going overseas for Chinese students are, of course, the degree but also to have a few years living in the Australian sunshine, enjoying the clean, fresh air here, uh, and enjoying life in a beautiful city like uh, Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, for Indian and Nepalese students, a lot of the reason is the opportunity to make money overseas. I mean, we may think that they're coming for our education, but many of them are coming for the opportunity to work very long hours in Australia. Well, that opportunity will be gone as well, and you can't put that opportunity online. Uh, really, we're, 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 we're worried, and we should be worried, that come July, we will have a complete evacuation of all of our international students. And if not an evacuation in July, then a failure of anyone to come back next year. Right. And so the profound implications for the finances and structure of universities and other education establishments in Australia must be amazing. Well, there are 20 universities in Australia, more than half of our public universities are sitting at over 15% international students. Uh, by comparison, only I think three public universities in all of North America have more than 15% international students. So we're extraordinarily exposed. And of course, the real problem for us in Australia are the Chinese students. Our, our Chinese student body is going to be extremely sensitive under current conditions. And there are current conditions where, well, let's just say, I expect that right now we have a travel ban on China. I expect that come June, China will have a travel ban on us. It'll be China warning their students not to come to Australia and maybe even prohibiting people from traveling to Australia. After all, some countries, starting with the United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, I think this weekend, have started prohibiting their own citizens from traveling abroad. So it's gone from don't come here to don't leave here uh, because you'll get sick somewhere else. So what about the 20 then? I mean, are they all going to survive? Are they going to have to collapse down? Are they going to cut their courses? Or well, they will survive, but we'll see much bigger cuts than we've had so far. So far, the University of Sydney announced $200 million in cuts uh, for semester one. Uh, UTS announced $100 million in cuts. But we are looking at three big concurrent reasons why China is likely to pull its students home. First, Chinese universities need the students. Uh, in China, because of the one-child policy, there has been a now a, a peaking and starting in the 2020s, a dramatic fall of the number of students hitting university age. Now, Taiwan, South Korea have already been through that. And both Taiwan and South Korea have been looking at 
closing entire universities because they simply don't have the students that they used to have. Well, in China, they have all ordered, this is in 2019, several of their lowest tier universities to simply convert into technical schools, essentially converting universities to TAFEs because there's just not the demand for university education to keep them in business. An infusion of some seven to 900,000 uh, low estimates of Chinese students abroad are 700,000, high estimates are 900,000. An infusion of, say, 800,000 Chinese students into Chinese universities would go a long way to keeping them in business throughout the 2020s. It would save a lot of pain back in China. Uh, second big reason, foreign exchange. You know, the yuan has been under pressure. Now, Australian dollars <laughs> under pressure. It's not just the yuan. But we in Australia don't have any political considerations of trying to keep the dollar up. China has been desperately trying to prevent a slide in the yuan throughout the U.S.-China trade war, throughout the slowing of the Chinese economy. They don't want to see capital flee the country. Well, international education for China is a $30 billion, that's U.S. billion, dollars, $30 billion a year outflow of money just for the tuition. That's not counting the money that goes out for living expenses. Either. So maybe $50 billion a year, maybe more in money leaving China through the student uh, route. Well, for China, that's 30 to $50 billion less to have to worry about if they keep the students home. And finally, China is looking to score a propaganda victory here. We've already seen that with Chinese aid to Italy, where they've tried to declare a huge propaganda victory. Once China needed aid, now China is giving aid to Europe, helping them in their time of need. And, you know, China protested vehemently when the United States and Australia travel bans on China back February 1st and 2nd. Well, to be able to put a travel ban on Australia <laughs> in return would be a big propaganda victory for China. And it's not just Australia, of course, the United States as well. Mm. Right. So this is quite an existential question, then, isn't it, for the structure and the future of education in Australia? We have a, well, some homegrown students, right? Well, not, still have, not enough, um, right? Look, the, the University of Sydney, I, I don't know all the statistics for every university off the top of my head, but I will tell you, University of Sydney is now 50% international students. Yeah. Well, what happens if, you, if they all, all disappear? And I, I, I don't want to be alarmist. I, I want to alarm people. Uh, that is to say, you know, if things can continue as they are with international travel shut down, and what's more, if international travel or if countries like Australia remain shut down for the six to 18 months we're talking about uh, while China reopens for business, well, who's going to come to Australia? Would you send your kids to a country in crisis when instead you could keep them home and educate them at home? So mm -hmm. I think we're looking, we're looking next semester, or if not next semester, then certainly for the 2021 school year at a complete disappearance of Chinese students, a likely disappearance of Indian students, and other nationalities as well. Remember, we still have something like 10% of our international students come from North America. Well, you know, they're not going to be able to travel to Australia. And, and the real question is how long the crisis continues. If the crisis is over in a month, okay, it's just China. Uh, China has the propaganda I incentive and these other, you know, China has the three big incentives, empty universities, need for foreign exchange, and desire for a propaganda win. China has the incentive to pull all of its students regardless. But if the crisis actually continues, nobody's coming to Australia uh, in coming months. And in fact, people are starting to trying to get home already. Uh, Chinese students have been trying to get home from the US and Canada and UK uh, for the last couple of weeks. They found it difficult, but with universities closed, that's what they want to do. And we're going to face the same kinds of trends. <laughs> right. So the forward path then means that universities are going to find it financially quite difficult, right? So do you think they're going to reach to the government to try and well, get some help along with everybody else? Say, let's just say I work at a university and for the first time I'm worried. Right. When we were only talking about the China travel ban, I thought, well, universities are going to take a financial hit, but they're well placed to take it. I mean, they've been really behaving, been behaving irresponsibly with construction and research spending, and they're going to have to scale back that irresponsible spending. In a way, I viewed it as a, I don't want to say a, a, a good thing, but as a welcome corrective to the 
irresponsible behavior of universities over the last 10 years. Now I am worried. I mean, now I feel like uh, it's not only tourism jobs that are at stake. It's not only, you know, private sector jobs who are at stake. It's my job that's at stake. And usually we as academics, we don't worry about that. We have jobs for life. We're tenured. We have you know, stable employment in quasi, you know, quasi government institutions. Uh, but if the university simply can't pay your salary, then it's time to worry. And I think that it, you know, at, at Australia's highly international student dependent universities, and there we're talking the entire group of eight, uh, also universities like UTS, uh, like Macquarie, I, I think they're going to face severe financial stress before the end of this year. And that kind of financial stress can't be dealt with by just moving money around. And, you know, and right now we're all the universities have restrictions like no hiring, no international travel, no you know, discretionary expenses. Uh, if, the, if, if things are still looking the way they are now, come August, come July and August, we're going to be looking at staff cuts. And I don't mean just casual staff, which is bad enough, uh, permanent staff cuts. So do you think the University of Tasmania's model, where they've shrunk the courses right. and shrunk the staff, is a harbinger of what we're going to see? Well, they are trying to get ahead of the curve, right? So University of Tasmania has had you know, this plan on the shelf for a while with a lot of staff resistance to the plan to reorganize, slim down, get rid of this plethora, an enormous number of degrees. Well, they've said now's the time to do it. Uh, because they know they're going to have to cut uh, expenses enormously this year. And they may as well take the plan off the shelf and make the cuts now. Uh, but we're going to see cuts at other universities as well. I mean, let me put it this way. Our business schools at places like Sydney and UNSW are roughly two-thirds international students. Mm. Well, half of their students are going to disappear. I mean, a few of those students will already be in Australia, will stay, will, but we're looking at half of their enrollments evaporating. And I said, like I said, if not in June, then likely in January. Uh, well, you can't have half your enrollments vanish and keep all of your staff. Mm. That, that just can't happen. And you know, we're looking at redundancies. And uh, like I said, I'm worried for the first time about my own job. Now, I'm not in a part of a university that's heavily international. I'm in a sociology department in a faculty of arts. But even in our faculty, we're looking at 15, 20 percent international students. And on top of that, our faculty gets subsidized by the business school. I mean, every university in Australia uses this model of the business school subsidizing international students in the business school, subsidizing the rest of the university. Well, that subsidy is going to disappear. The business schools are going to go from being a profit center to just barely breaking even uh, all at once. Uh, frankly, I don't know how universities are going to handle it. I, but my concern is not, well, <laughs> my concern for me is how universities are going to handle it. My concern for the country is that universities aren't yet talking about this. Yeah. I, I haven't seen anyone suggest that a six month crisis in Australia would have any particular effect on universities, yet it will have a massive effect on universities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, let me change gear slightly because I saw that you coined a really interesting phrase the other week <laughs> to talk about the way that Australia does things. Because I actually think there's a connection yeah. between that phrase and what you're talking about. Australian pro formalism. I have been complaining about pro formalism. For the last six or eight years, it's one of the most frustrating aspects of my life in, in the quasi-public sector in Australia. Proformalism is behaving in a pro forma manner. And if everything is pro forma okay, then it's okay and you don't worry about it. And I always used to give the example of uh, students being admitted on the basis of a Yelp score, an English, uh, international English language proficiency test score. You know, if the student can get the score of 6.5, well, then they speak English. And if they speak English, pro forma, you don't have to offer any support. Pro forma, they can have all the same essay assignments as everyone else. Pro forma, you don't have to change anything. Of course, in reality, coming in with that Yelp of 6.5 doesn't mean the student can perform at the level of a native speaking Australian student. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, that kind of box checking mentality in Australia. I mean, when <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story, uh, and I hope people enjoy the story enough that they're willing to listen to it. Uh, when we were told to work at home, 
two weeks ago, we were all sent an email, we want you to work at home. We were also sent a checklist, the workplace health and safety checklist. And that checklist had a whole series of 25 items that in order to work at home, we had to check. Now they told us to work at home, so we got to check the boxes. What are the boxes? That you have a five point swivel office chair with lumbar support. Well, I don't look, who has a five point swivel chair at home? Um, and the reason it has to be five point is so that you don't lean back and tip over the chair, right? So uh, you have five point support and instead of a usual four point chair like we all have at home. Mm -hmm. Well, none of us have this, but we have to take the box Anyway, you know, I have to tick the box that I have a document holder because at the university, everyone's issued with a document holder so that you don't have to look down at a document, which might hurt your neck. You can look up. Now, this is pro formalism at its worst. You're going to work at home. You're going to check the boxes. Pro forma, everybody has a safe working environment. Does everyone actually have a safe working environment? Who knows? But pro forma, we do. Now, in the international education space, uh, you know, pro forma, we have a healthy university that's delivering all of its content online. Because none of our content has been disrupted, pro forma, nothing's changed. We don't have to address the issue. Well, you know, I think we have to address the issue. If you want to start using pro, pro, pro formalism in your own speech, just think about people have been, how people have been behaving with social distancing. Uh, you know, it's uh, pro formalism everywhere when it comes to staying at home. I mean, when you work at home by going to the library and sitting next to someone in the library, that is not working at home. That is pro forma working at home. And we're full of it. Mm. Well, the reason I centered on that was because I think you put your finger on what I've also observed having you know spent time overseas as well as here that there's very much ticking the box and appearing to do the right thing, right. but actually come down the level and you actually realise that the right things aren't necessarily being done, but everybody can point to the list and say, I've done it, so therefore oh, I'm fine. Stories in the newspapers uh, were that travellers arriving from Italy were simply handed a flyer telling them that they should self-isolate at home. Hmm. Pro forma, problem solved, right? Yeah. They've been handed the flyer. What else do you want us to do? Well, of course, us. <laughs> Of course, other countries are taking much more proactive measures. Australia is an island. Australia should not be having this crisis. Uh, you know, Australia could have stopped things at the border. It chose not to. And now we're all going to pay the price. Mm. Well, look, Salvatore, I really appreciate your time today. And I think you've made a couple of really, really important points. You now, the education specific point, but also this behavioral thing, which I think is probably in a way as worrying because in the middle of the current crisis that we've got, we're seeing a lot of superficiality and uh, a lot of the real core issues is being swept to one side, in my view. So I think it's an important item to uh, table. Right. Well, you know, when, when, I, I, when I started teaching this semester, I swept aside the first three weeks of class. And the first lesson I told them was when you go wash your hands, you know, we're both men. A lot of people watching might be men. And we've seen men in the men's room go to the sink, wet their hands, splat, splat, <laughs> and they've washed, they've pro forma washed their hands. Well, you know, there's no more pro forma hand washing these days. You know, everybody out there, you know, wash your hands. Take it seriously. Yeah, great. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll catch up again down the track. Great. Thanks. Good to talk to you. And keep safe. Cheers. So there you have it from Salvatore. I think his commentary about the behavioural aspect of Australia and Australians in particular is really worth reflecting on in the current environment. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.